I gave people all the stuff they really needed. Social security checks, utility bills, TV guide. I want a TV guidance counselor. TV guidance counselor. Stand up to watch all night. And everything's gonna be alright with my TV guidance counselor. Hello, welcome to TV Guidance Counselor. I am Ken Reed, your TV Guidance Counselor. I am the Boston-based stand-up comedian that each and every week, 10 years in, uh, we talk about classic TV using TV Guide magazines from my personal collection as the gateway into our collective past. Welcome to 2024, everybody. We're still doing it. Uh, a lot of podcasts called to quits, but uh, not me, not me. Uh, hopefully out doing more stand-up as well. And 2024 thus far, fingers crossed, is better than 2023. Hopefully it is for you as well, and hopefully it continues to be better than 2023. This week's episode is certainly an indicator that 2024 is better than 2023, because my guest is the amazing director-producer Alan Arkish. And Alan, you probably best know from directing uh, movies like uh, Caddyshack 2, although we don't talk about that here, even though I think it's the superior Caddyshack, um, but Rock and Roll High School. Uh, he also has done a ton of television here, the Temptations miniseries, uh, the Heroes, Crossing Jordan. We talk about it all. Uh, he is such a good guy, such a huge fan of movies and television. He teaches now at the AFI, as he should, because he is a wealth of knowledge, and I am so grateful for him. Uh, to him for sitting down and talking to me about his work and TV and uh, what he watched and all that kind of stuff, because th this is exactly why I do the show, everybody. So please sit back, relax, and enjoy this week's episode of TV Guidance Counselor with my guest, Alan Arkish. TV is my friend, and it has been always there for me in time of need. One of the coolest offices I've seen uh, on this show since I started doing it. Alan Arkish, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing very well. Ready to talk to you. Well, you are the person to talk to it about uh, because I, uh, you know, a lot of people, a lot of my listeners will know mostly the, probably the movies that you worked on, uh, movies that you made. It's uh, Rock and Roll High School comes up a lot on this show, um, but a ton of others yeah. as well. But not everyone might know all the television you've worked on like it's an enormous body of work and in so many different genres yeah and shows that they wouldn't um you know i think a lot of people probably associate the, the early you know the joe dante corman days with the stuff you've done because it right. tends to be the uh the cult audience but i mean big shows uh, shows nominated for an emmy in the very episode that you worked on yeah i've, I've got a like four, four or five emmy nominations and I think it must be around 400 uh, episodes and uh, and I either directed or I directed and produced or produced. Because you've created shows like I, I often bring up on the show how, especially in the early 80s, a lot of the guys from the underground sort of exploitation area often got hired by TV because they knew they could work fast and get it done <laughs> and get yeah. it under budget. That's how I started. I mean, I've done... About 15 pilots, of which 10 have sold. That is a crazy batting average for people that don't know the TV business. That is Pretty nuts. Good. Pretty good. <laughs> and, I, you know, you're so right. I was offered fame. I, was, I did a pilot called Summer that nobody saw. And the only reason I got offered that, because I was not in the television business, was because they had been turned down by a couple of people and they wanted someone who could do high school kids. So they, I met with them about rock and roll high school. And, and that led to the same company was MGM Television. That led to fame because fame was looking to revitalize itself. It was in syndication for its um, second year. And I think in the TV guide, it's about the fourth year of syndication, yep. uh, the issue that you have. And so I went in and had a meeting about it. I had never done a television series. And my reaction to fame, what I saw was not great. <laughs> and uh, I kind of told them, you know, and I said that you're not telling the stories 
through the music. You have a music show at the beginning and a music show at the end, and the music numbers should be part of the story. And also, you're doing show tunes. <laughs> yeah. You know, this is 1984. In New York. You're in the middle of TV. <laughs> yeah, I had just done three videos. I had done a video with, uh, just finished one with Elvis Costello at that point. And yeah. before that was Mick Jagger and Bette Midler and Fleetwood Mac. And um, so I just said you should you should be using hip hop music. And I got the job. And so I stayed there. I did like two seasons on fame. I think I did about 14 episodes. So. Yeah. I think you did more than any of the other directors since it hit syndication. So that was for the listeners who don't know, there was a, there was a movement in the early eighties where shows that had been on a network for a season and had been canceled were then picked up in first run syndication. There was about five or six shows and ended up being, far more successful and airing and having a huge oh yeah fame was enormous oh I, had, yeah. um, I, I had a friend on who grew up in israel went to israel every summer and he was saying they were obsessed with fame there all of his cousins were like have you been to new york it's we so all want fame i know i okay so fame used to pay less than a network rate there's different rates okay and fame was a syndicated show, so it had a lower rate. It was just fine. I, you know, so I took that job and I did some episodes and I had a friend of mine visiting and uh, we walk out to the mailbox and I open the mailbox and there's a check. <laughs> and I open up, there's this big check. And he said, what's that for? And I said, I think it's for walking to the mailbox. <laughs> <laughs> because fame was repeated within a week, you got your residuals right away. And then I started getting the foreign residuals. And Israel was like off the charts. Yeah. By the way, I just want to say this to everyone. According to my foreign residuals, I am huge in Portugal. <laughs> it's not a bad place to be. They get good food. So, you know, that's no, not <laughs> Portugal, they love heroes and they love crossing Jordan. So NBC must have made some big deal in Portugal. It's funny, that makes sense because when I talk to friends who've grown up in other countries, you know, non-English speaking countries, the shows that we export are police procedurals and action shows yeah. <laughs> because it translates. Yeah. Comedy doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> it makes perfect yeah, sense. I, uh, I got a lot of residuals on moonlighting, but... Uh, a lot of residuals on Crossing Jordan. Crossing Jordan was a big show overseas, yeah. and I had done the pilot, so, you know. Was, I believe good place to be. this may be a false memory, and if it's a real memory, I'm apologizing for you 20-something years later. Okay. But I believe you shot exteriors for Crossing Jordan in Boston, here in Boston? Yes, we did. On the pilot, we did. And then we had a crew go up and shoot a bunch of exteriors uh, each year to freshen up the bin, so to speak. <laughs> so this must have been the pilot, um, but I was working for our local CBS affiliate at the time when I was in college, and I used to have to run tapes all around the city. And totally not mm -hmm. paying attention, I walked right through and ruined a shot. <laughs> they were shooting oh exteriors God. for Crossing Jordan. So if it was wow. one of the ones you did, I'm sorry. <laughs> It's okay. It was a it was a very big day, probably. So. Yeah, I was like, "How did I not notice?" I think I walked over Dolly Track. Like I was going to the State House. <laughs> like, gotta get this in time. Um, yeah, but that show went like something like eight seasons or something. It was like over well over a hundred episodes. One hundred seventeen. <laughs> not bad. Not too bad. Not bad. But the ones you turned down, you know. I mean, I turned down Party of Five, and. I didn't get it. That makes sense, though. <laughs> and the show that I did take was a more interesting show to me. And it, it was a backdoor pilot called X's and O's. And it was all shot in Nashville. But I turned down a bunch of shows um, that later went on to become big shows. And, and you know, it just, it's just what appeals to you and, and what's going to work. And that whole process of... You get the script, you think about it, then you have one meeting, or at most two, with the showrunner. And that's it. It's a shotgun wedding. You know? <laughs> yeah, and it's it, it makes sense that you would do pilots as well, because it seems more like a movie where I imagine it's much harder to come into a show, an established show, as a director, where 
you can't put your stamp on it as much. You kind of have to lock into what's already been established. You know, I'm glad you mentioned that because I think one of the things that makes my viewing aspect to it interesting and why I chose that particular date. Yep, we're looking at 1985, by the way, so people don't know. We have December right. 85. Yeah. I didn't choose it. I choose it because Sybil was on the cover, but it was right at a place when I was doing a lot of shows that were on the air. Okay. So one of the things that I learned after fame, I started, I wanted to do another, my agent said, you should do more shows. This is really, it's going great. And I said, well, I can't do a show unless I really watch it and I really like it. And she said, so what do you like? And I said, well, I love St. Elsewhere. And she said, let me work on that. And it took 10 months and a couple of meetings and observing on the set. And then I did St. Elsewhere. Now, St. Elsewhere, this is going to be a little technical. Okay, St. Right, yeah. Elsewhere is based on soft lighting. And what they do is the whole ceiling was made out of muslin and they banged a lot of light through the ceiling. So everything had a good basic glow. It wasn't modeling with the light because the style of the show was you could shoot anyone anywhere in any room. And it was a handheld show mostly. And but it was not like, say, your NYPD Blue which was obviously handheld the movement. This was just the convenience of using wider lenses and getting right in on these wonderful actors. And the stories, I don't know if you remember, would they would walk down the hallway and the next story would come walking in. It was a flow to it. And so I would go from that show to moonlighting. And moonlighting is hard light, long lenses, you know, a, a completely different style. You know, shots you could do on Moonlighting, you could not do on Fame. So you, and the thing that about it was, I didn't think of it as being handcuffed. I thought of it as if I was at Warner Brothers and I was Michael Curtiz and I was doing a Western and then a pirate picture and then a romance. So there's a different style to each. So I learned how a long lens made me feel when I directed a scene with a long lens and how a wide angle lens. And so it was like all these ways of shooting and what they meant because I was actually doing them and seeing them and cutting them together. And I was kind of like the, the line I tell my students is I put them in my backpack, Yeah, you know? And then when I got to do my first pilot, which was called the Bronx Zoo, um, it was about a high school in the South Bronx, and the producer of Family Ties was the one who was who was uh, the executive producer. And it was a Paramount show, and it was on for about a season and a half. So I'm designing the look of that show, which is what you do as a pilot director. So I was using all the ideas and things that I had found along the way uh, in directing up to that point, and. That is kind of what I did. And so when I would design a show, I would set down and make the set so that it reflected the showrunner's desire of how they wanted to write the scenes and how we wanted the show to flow and how we wanted the show to look. And then as the director producer, I was the person who had to get each director to understand why we were doing things a certain way and to make sure that certain tropes happen. For instance, on Crossing Jordan, Jordan or whoever, mostly Jordan, would come upon a crime scene and there'd be a body there. And that sets up the story. And we never wanted, we always wanted that to be subjective. We come to the crime scene with her or we tie her into the crime scene and she would look at the body and then we would shoot the body from her point of view with a little piece of her shoulder in there. So you saw her in a physical space tied to this body and then we do a reverse up, a lowish angle of her identifying with it and her getting into it. And with the certain piece of score we had, that would establish the A story. And so directors who came in and shot it objectively 
it was no good. It didn't help us. We sure we saw Jordan, but we didn't. We that was too theatrical. We needed to be inside Jordan's head so that when the Elise's Jordan theme would resonate. I absolutely realize why you had so many pilots that went. There's sort of two tracks that I that I know, especially cinema directors who then go into TV sort of go into. And it's the journeyman, right. like, I just say, get it done, and I'm there, and it's boom, boom, boom. And then the people are like, right. they'll know I directed it. They'll go, this episode feels different. Somebody directed it. But you, uh, and right. I think this probably comes from being a true cinema fan, and also someone who worked in the, you know, for Corman, where you had to, you had restrictions that you had to go with <laughs> you sort of are more adaptable yeah. when people have no rules and no restrictions they don't tend to do as good work because they don't have to be they can just go with their first thought they don't have to be as innovative or do something interesting the saying we always had about around the corman group was roger will let you make any movie you want as long as it's the movie that he wants. <laughs> right. By that, it means if you want to make a high school musical, you better have something to sell. And in this case, it was blowing up the high school. Right. So if you're doing a car chase movie, you better deliver a lot of great car chase footage. Or you're doing a women in prison movie like Jonathan Demme's Caged Heat. So you got to have the fighting in the showers naked. You got to have the break from prison. But Jonathan put another storyline in, which was about how the police, the, the, the prison administration and the wardens would try to control the behavior of the prisoners through psychotropic drugs and through lobotomies. And this happened. This is true. Yeah. And. So that's what Roger wanted. He wanted some real content in it uh, with the other stuff to get everyone in the door. This is something I think of a lot is how the, the mainstream of movies and TV now, like sort of subject wise, are basically right. the the genre of the 70s and 80s. <laughs> Like that's become yeah. the mainstream and, um, you know, like a show like heroes that never would have been, I mean, t technology wise, but also that never would have been made 10 years earlier. No. And what they get make now would never have been, although there are variations on it. Um, basically, uh, the era that we're talking about, the eighties was all genre shows. And so people would joke and say, it's not what the show is about. It's about how you do it. And it's the casting. You know, it's like, it's the casting, stupid. It's the casting and the chemistry. That's what they test. And that's what they care about. And the plot on the pilot just has to be good enough. And Jill... Hennessy tested great on Jordan and her character tested great. And then we were on the air. Whereas on Heroes, the concept tested great. And much to the surprise of the network, Hiro Nakamura tested great, as did the cheerleader and the cheerleader's family. So as an there is nothing more exciting than a first season of a show that's working. Because you learn with each episode and you learn what works. So you kind of mold it in that direction. And if you're doing your job right, you end up with a first season like the first season of Heroes. Yeah. Where you just keep upping the stakes, you know. And the first season of Jordan was like that, but not on that level of, of Heroes. And you have to have a director staff and a writing staff and a showrunner who is sensitive to what's going on. And, you know, all of a sudden, you know, the network is saying uh, about Hiro Nakamura, is he going to talk Japanese the whole time? <laughs> yeah. It's kind of the point. That's why they like him. <laughs> <laughs> now, why do they all have to have superhero powers? Yeah. Isn't that, that's too expensive, but that's what you bought. Yep. You know? And so there would be these times on that show where we would go, I don't know. <laughs> this is too much, maybe. And one of them was the door opens and there is Masi Oka with a, a whole samurai outfit on that's futuristic. And he says, I am Hiro Nakamura. I come from the future. 
And it was written and it was beautifully directed. And we all just went, man, this is, I don't know. <laughs> and my daughters were home and having a sleepover and they found all the cuts of heroes on my desk. And they started watching them and my phone rings at like one in the morning. I'm doing a night shoot. And I go, and they go, dad, we, uh, he says, I'm here on Nakamura and I come from the future. What happens next? I said, I'm shooting it now. <laughs> Let me put you on speaker. <laughs> right. We knew it worked, you know? So that was the secret, you know, a lot of stuff happened on, on heroes that became organic. The thing that ultimately happened was it just kept getting bigger with each really interesting plot twist. It got bigger and bigger. And with having this Uber story about this company that was a paper company that was doing it, it became more of that. And look, I directed Company Man on that, which is when they're trapped in the house and the house catches fire and it's all this effects. And... Um, that was a great episode, but that was in a way the beginning of our downfall because it was so good that we had to, by the time we got to the end of the season, we were carrying a 50 pound bag of a plot, yeah, which we could never resolve. And the second season we didn't. I mean, you've illustrated like when you describe the way Roger would approach these things as a business guy, but he's also a filmmaker yeah. um, versus the way that executives yeah. in television do where he understands this is what people are paying for to go see and whatever you want to sn sneak something in through the allegory or Trojan horse, something interesting in there. Whereas the networks, they don't understand why things work. The things they think will work never do. Uh, the, the illustration I always use is when one of the four, I think, remakes of Faulty Towers, they decided to get rid of the Basil Faulty character. And they made it just about the hotel. <laughs> they were like, he's right, not likable. Right. Well, you know, I don't know if you know Bob Lou Mandel and, uh, is. And, yes, of course. Yeah, and Logan's. Uh, they created the series Parenthood. We're having lunch one day and talking about network notes and they said let me just say that if a network person comes up to you and says i gotta tell you this this is so funny this happened to me this is a great story it's so funny you know it's not gonna be funny yeah <laughs> because the secret is not that it's funny it's the commonality of it and that's what adds the humor to it and i have to say that for the last 10 years of my career, I never got a, I got almost no network or studio notes that were worth shit. No. And, and I basically left the business because I could not stand all these terrible notes. And it was part of a movement of consolidation that when the TV networks became part of a larger corporate structure, the corporate structure dominated and you ended up with a large middle management mm -hmm. and their goal was the repetition of what they thought worked. And the goal of the artist is don't repeat yourself. Right. You know, it's kind of why we don't have conservative Republican artists or comedians <laughs> make America great again. <laughs> Again is poison. Yeah. yeah. David Bowie was nothing again. No. You know? I'm on the same page with you. It's, yeah. it's, and we saw that in the 80s, and this 85 is a good, uh, a good era where we really, you know, as I do stand up, and as soon as you said, as a, uh, you know, an executive came up to you and said, this was funny, like anytime anyone says, like, oh, you do stand up, let me tell you this funny thing. It's, it's never, never, ever. Um, and no. there, it's, I've never seen a, a conservative Republican who was funny because they don't have the point of view that is required or the empathy or the humanity. <laughs> empathy, 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 and the ability to understand how someone else feels. Here's why I chose 85. I had fame uh, still on the air and episodes of fame. I was doing St. Elsewhere at that time. I uh, had a meeting on Moonlighting and was about to start directing Moonlighting. And I think in that year, I did an episode of L.A. Law, and I did my first pilot. So 
I felt that was, it wasn't that that week in TV Guide registered right. with me, you know. I mean, some of it is there, but that's what I was in the middle of at that particular time. So how did we get there from here, you know, here, so to speak? Being a boomer, so I'm 75 years old, okay? So I think we had our first TV when I was four. Let's just say three or four. This is in New Jersey? That. Yeah, in Jersey, northern New Jersey. So I was in the tri-state area. So there was, I think, six channels. There was the three network channels. There was Channel 9, which I believe was WOR, Channel 5, and Channel 11. And 9, 5, and 11 each had a baseball team. The Giants, the Dodgers, and the Yankees. And so that was a pretty intense film I mean, television market. And to fill all that programming, they ran a lot of movies. They ran movies all night. And I'm sure you've heard many people mention Million Dollar Movie. Yep. And Million Dollar Movie was my gateway, in some ways, into who I am today. Because I'd watch all these classic movies. I didn't realize they were edited and panned and scanned. I didn't know anything. How would you know? But, yeah, you know, but on Monday when they'd run the new film of the week, and if it was King Kong, let me tell you, on the playground the next day, there was talk about nothing but King Kong, okay? So into that, I was, you had uh, Walt Disney Presents, okay? Which I believe was Sunday nights. Yep. And they, they understood, everyone watched that. But when they did Davy Crockett, that was like the Beatles on Ed Sullivan, Okay. <laughs> When Davy Crockett registered so heavily and with that song, and I look, I could be wrong, but that seemed to be the first real merchandising of a TV show because I had a coonskin cap, I had a flintlock, and I had that record, which I my parents bought me a little plastic record player, you know, and the record was yellow, and. Well, you see, I have 10,000 albums. So if that's my only record, it was in heavy rotation. <laughs> yeah. They were going to kill me. And so I loved that. And I loved the Disney stuff and, and the, you know, the stuff about Disneyland and the shows. But I also watched Mickey Mouse Club in the afternoons. And each day of the week had a different name and I liked it. But what I really liked in it was the serialized stories. They had these little half hours. I don't know how long they really were, but they were part of each show, and they were serialized stories. All 90% were about boys and boy friendship. Yeah. And there was one called Spin and Marty, which took place on a dude ranch and was quirky and white shadow. I loved the serialization. And in analyzing for myself... What is it about network television that registers for me? It was the fact, this is so, I loved coming next week. Yeah. At the end of some satisfying thing, I would come coming next week. It gave my life meaning. <laughs> I have to be there next week. You have 100% summed up like the core of the show for me is the, you know, uh, in my particular childhood was pretty tumultuous and chaotic, but having something to look forward to and having it be consistent. Like if they said we're on Thursday at eight, it's there <laughs> unless something terrible is yeah. happening. And to have that consistency uh, was a lot <laughs> as a kid when the world is, you have no control yeah. over anything. Yeah. And so those were like really big things for me. Um, and um, other shows uh, that registered me Saturday morning, obviously was a big thing. So Saturday morning. Okay. So TV would start really start with programming around seven in the Jersey area. You'd start having your cartoons and Crusader Rabbit yep. and all of that. But between six and seven, if you couldn't sleep because you were so excited, they had two shows. One was called The Big Picture. And The Big Picture was old army training films. <laughs> and they would run them for a half hour. 
And then they shift over to something that every Jersey boy wants to see. And that was Modern Farmer, which was <laughs> relevant films about, about farming and, and tractors and stuff. But I sat through them and waiting for Crusader Rabbit, which was, of course, the antecedent to Rocky this. and Bullwinkle. Yeah. Uh, uh, Alan's wearing a Natasha, uh, uh, Boris and Natasha shirt. Did you ever meet Jay Ward or go to um, the studios when you moved to L.A.? Oh, no, but I really loved it. I mean, to me, in my mind, uh, Rocky and Bullwinkle is the same place as Mad Magazine. Yeah. There was a smartness to it, a cheekiness to it. And so Saturday morning also was The Lone Ranger and a show called Circus Boy. Oh, yes, with Mickey Dolenz. I'm doing St. Elsewhere. And the... Production manager, line producer is a guy by the name of Abby Singer. Abby Singer is so famous, they named the shot after him. And it's the shot before the last shot. Because Abby would say, this is the last shot. And he goes, oh, one more. And that's why they called the Abby Singer. So I love talking to Abby. And I think I asked him what shows he worked on to begin with. And he told me he was the second second on, that's, a, that's the assistant director, on The Lone Ranger. I went, no. <laughs> How? I mean, shoot it and all this. <laughs> you know. And so Lone Ranger was like early 50s. So now this is like the 80s. So he said they used to shoot it out in Chatsworth and stuff. And I said, wow, that's a long distance to go. And he goes, long distance, Alan. There was no freeway. <laughs> and I said, there was no freeway there? No. At a certain point, it was all dirt roads. So to make my 7 a.m. call sometimes, and I had to be there at 6, um, I just slept in my car. We camped out and slept. <laughs> right. And we shot those episodes in three days. Yeah. <laughs> and how did you do that? I said, well, we'd get the scripts for four or five episodes. And if the Butch Masters gang was after him, we'd shot the Butch Masters gang going over the hill after the wrong And then we'd change the clothes of the gang and we'd do... <laughs> a different gang and so forth. And we'd shoot all the stuff together. So I said, what other shows did you do, Abby? He says, well, I um, I was an AD on the Three Stooges shorts. Yes. So, <laughs> and then he said, I'm a show you probably never saw. I was on it for a long time. It's called Circus Boy. Go, Circus Boy with Mickey Dolenz, <laughs> you know? Said, yeah. And I said, don't tell me. Did you ever work with Mickey Dolenz again? I'm leading. He goes, yeah, I did the monkeys. And I said, you did? He says, yeah, I liked them better as circus. <laughs> <laughs> and she said that uh, there was a lot of pot smoke in the, oh, yes. by Mickey on the monkeys. <laughs> yes. So those were those. And, of course, the I always liked breaking the third wall, a fourth wall, whichever wall it is. <laughs> All walls. And um, – Soupy sales. Yes. Now, I just thought it was the funniest thing in the world. And it was so stupid. And for those of you who don't know, Soupy had a show called Lunch with Soupy on Saturdays. And it was literally Soupy with these hand puppets. Yeah. Oh, my father used to be able to do puppetry with hand puppets as good as this, you know. And they had... Just the crew, it seemed. There's some one guy doing all these stupid voices. And then they had these giant dogs, White Fang and Black Tooth. And you never saw them. You only saw their arm. And they'd come into the frame. And you always heard the crew laughing. Yeah. And then he'd sit down and have lunch. And it would be like, say it was a something with potato chips. When he ate the potato chips, there'd be these loud sound effects of wood breaking, you know, and soup, he didn't allow. Anyway, I thought this stuff was hilarious. And at one point he was on in the afternoon and he said that, uh, you know, it was new day after New Year's. And he said, so listen, kids, um, are your parents still asleep? Because if they are, do soup a flavor. Go into their bedroom, go into their wallet, and look for those pictures of George Washington, I, 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 Andrew Jackson, right. and um, Abraham Lincoln. Get those pictures together, 
and send them to me, care of Super Sales, and, and I will send you a postcard from Puerto Rico. <laughs> <laughs> Kids did it, and they took Supi off the air. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And he, I believe that one, too, that was an improv, because they had, they were, like, ran a minute short or something, and they were like, just whatever, oh, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> he's like, all right. And it's that, you bring up everything that I, that, to, tying together the the era of television that you started in in your work specifically and moonlighting is a great example of this where you're of the first generation that started making TV that grew up with TV. Before that it was yes. people who knew stuff from radio or they were just kind of making it up or so it started to get more self-reflexive and Mad Magazine is a big part of that as well. I mean, there's so many shows and pop culture things I learned of just from Mad Magazine that I don't think I ever saw the original. And, and the other aspect to that is we were the first generation to have a record player. Yes. So we always had access to music and we always had access to a radio and AM radio was our internet. The message went out that way and it was incredibly integrated. And so all of a sudden we're making movies in film school, you know, and Marty Scorsese combines the records he loved as a kid with how he felt about watching um, Scorpio Rising by Kenneth Anger and the use of records on that. And The Graduate using, that was the first movie to use a hit song that was two years old. No movie had used a previously known song. And so you're sitting there in the audience and the song that you have heard 10,000 times in your dorm room, you know, that emo, hello darkness, my old friend, you're immediately empathizing with Benjamin. So these cultural cross things were part of that generation. And um, the other well, the signpost in all of this is, of course, the Ed Sullivan Show. Yeah. And as a person whose family were Holocaust survivors, and many of them had come from Europe and were all living together, you always watched Ed Sullivan together. That was the demographic that today never, ever happens. And you'd watch it because your uncle, you know, my grandfather, Jacob, wanted to see the Morseyev dancers, you know. And my sister wanted to see the little talking um, senior Topo Wences, Gijo. You know? <laughs> Yes, and all of that stuff. And when one thing after another until in 1956 and Elvis appeared. And um, that was pretty exciting. But February 9th, 1964 is where... The Big Bang with the Universe started, and that was the Beatles. Mm -hmm. And I actually teach that in my uh, school my, at the AFI, where I'm a teacher. <laughs> so that was the the universal moment. You know, the next day at school, everyone was singing those songs. Everyone wanted a Ludwig drum set, a Rickenbacker guitar. You know, so Ed Sullivan was a way into all of that that turned into hoot nanny and shindig for me you know so if the birds were on shindig i was glued you know and so those were like really signposts for me and what i watched yeah, I mean, it was true True broadcasting, is what I always say. Like, Ed Sullivan is true broadcasting. They're trying to be everything to everyone, but in a good way, <laughs> where yeah. you get exposed to stuff. Like, I, I always say now, you can watch or listen to anything that's ever been made, but you have to already know you like it. <laughs> And that wasn't the case. We were watching things like, you know, for the farm report and the, uh, the army film, stuff like that. You would never have watched those like chosen to watch those, but they were enriching in a no. weird way because it's just on like that, it, you know, and that's right. so many of the things when I was growing up, it was, you know, uh, USA network had a show called night flight that was on all night. If you may or may not yeah. recall, yeah, and it that. would be like, John Waters movies and old fifties educational films and, you know, punk rock documentaries and just stuff that I was like, all right, this is everything I like now, but I never would have sat and known to watch this. And that's what all those syndicated <laughs> movies did. And in the midst of all that, you'd have someone like Zachary. You yes. know who Zachary was? Yes. Zachary had a monster movie show every Saturday night. So, you know, 
you're 14 years old, you're home. <laughs> of course. And you're watching Zacharlick. And what it was, was he would run these old monster movies from a package of monster movies that were purchased, not all of them very good or some, and he would be the host, but he would put himself in the monster movie. So something would happen and he would cut to him and he'd go, oh my God, and he'd start running and he'd do these really bad uh, horror movie trope ideas. Like he would operate on someone's brain. And the brain was clearly a cauliflower. Yes. You know. <laughs> and he had, his wife was, or someone was named Gasport. And they were in this box. And he'd open up and talk to them. And and it was always, the he knew what was going to happen in the movie and so forth. And SCTV did a particularly good send-up it with John Cannon. Oh, oh uh, yes, Doctor T- Doctor Tongue's 3D House of Stewardesses. Oh, that's it. And they would go, "It's in 3D." Dude, it was 3D. Yeah. <laughs> so that yes. was like I'm, that was again breaking that wall and you know stretching your mind. But uh, Zachary also, so- like, I think he hosted a teen a teen dance show on that channel uh, in New York as Zachary. Yeah. He had a couple of hit records. Um, oh, yeah. And, uh, right. the Zachary dance party. And here's something. <laughs> on February, I'm going to guess it was the 13th. I'm not 100% sure of the date. At the Fillmore East, where I was an usher and also on the stage crew, the bill was Love from L.A., the Allman Brothers Band, and the Grateful Dead. And before, during the Saturday Night Late Show, we carried a coffin onto the stage, opened it, and out stepped Zachary, <laughs> who raised his cape and said, ladies and gentlemen, the goddamn Grateful Dead. <laughs> and it's live record (laughs) that's amazing like he for for people that don't know he had a a very beautiful uh voice like his speaking voice was really uh radio wise and frank uh henneletter used him as the voice of almer in the movie uh brain dead it's an uncredited zachary is the the monster wow um but that's like screaming jay hawkins coming out on stage in the coffin like that it's that kind of thing yeah (laughs) i did some thinking about what i used to watch and why Okay. I love cowboy movies. So seeing Rio Bravo was a huge thing for me. Why did I want to see Rio Bravo so much? Because everyone on it was on a TV show. Right. Um, You had Stumpy, who was on The Real McCoys. Ricky, Ozzy and Harriet. Ricky got singing with his eyes closed, you know, Lonesome Town. John Wayne is beyond reproach. And um, Dean Martin was Jerry Lewis's friend. And I was addicted to Jerry Lewis movies. So, but on TV, I watch regularly Have Gun Will Travel, The Rifleman, Rawhide, Yancey Derringer. I think that kind of took place in New Orleans, and Bonanza. And there was one with Steve McQueen, and he had a band of his hat, he had mirrors. Yes. Ah, I can't remember the name of it. Yes. I yeah. can't remember the name of it, but yeah. So most I would watch, I love to have Gun Will Travel because I love the theme song. It's great. You know, it's great. And the, the guitar playing on all of that. And in doing research as a director and, and preparing classes, I found out that many of the great action TV shows that I like were directed by the same person at some point. Ida Lupino. Oh, I had no idea. Was actress at Warner Brothers. And she used to say that I am, as an actress, I was the poor man's Betty Davis. And as director, I'm the poor man's Don Siegel. (laughs) And she was the only woman directing television. And she didn't direct Father Knows Best or any of those, you know, soft. She directed The Untouchables. (laughs) She directed Combat. Her, I, look, all of you listeners, go to your IMDb and look up her career. It's incredible. She she recently was on the Directors Guild membership card, and she deserved it. So those were the Westerns that I really liked, and many of them had great songs, and I loved the title sequence of all of them. 
you know. And I think, in retrospect, all the songs had a twangy guitar. Oh, yeah. As a music fan, I always say, too, like, the first, your first favorite song, as most music fans or musicians that I know, is a TV theme song. Because before you have yes. a record player, you know you can hear it every week. <laughs> you bet. You bet. And uh, so the half hours that I used to watch, of course, I Love Lucy. But it, it doesn't, it's not really a half hour because I think it was an hour show. Uh, and this was a segment of it was The Honeymooners. And I love The Honeymooners. And when we were doing Moonlighting, we did a Honeymooners episode. Yes. So I went back and looked at them again with uh, Jerry Finnerman, the cameraman and everything. And we realized that every Honeymooners show started with the same shot. Moved in at the door while the Titus were going. Every single episode that we saw, the camera bumps about six feet into the movie. We realized there must have been something in the floor that they never fixed. Yep. So when we did our version of it, we rolled up some tape and made a bump so the camera would bump in the same place. (laughs) That's so well observed and nerdy. Oh, God. You know, you're talking to Mr. Nerd. It's the best. Going back and watching them again, I was watching them out of nostalgia, but Sybil Shepard really didn't like them at all. She hated that he was always threatening violence against Alice and all of that and his attitude towards it and her cliche. And yet she always was the smartest. And I was very worried that as an actor, she would form an opinion and that would color the show. But as it turns out, she nailed it so well. And about 10 years ago or more, I um, bought a box set of The Honeymooners. And I thought, I'm going to show this to my daughters. I watched one episode. I go, they'll kill me. <laughs> yeah. This yeah. show does not play at all. Anymore. No. <laughs> no. You, it is purely for nostalgia. There is Jackie Gleason is the personification of toxic masculinity. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, he's throwing himself around. He's too loud. You know, and then every once in a while, they'd be playing golf and he'd say to Norton, so first thing we have to do is address the ball. And Norton (laughs) would say, hello, ball. And that would be really funny. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I watched the honeymooners, the Twilight Zone. The yes. Twilight Zone ruled. The Twilight yes. Zone was the next day at school, that was what you talked about, you know. It's a cookbook. <laughs> it's a cookbook. You directed a new one. Yes, right? I did. I directed the Misfortune Cookie with Elliot Gould. Uh and the Grateful Dead did the Twilight Zone theme for it. In eighty five, and it's great. <laughs> yes. And uh that was one of my first T V episodes. And you know, the um, it's a cookbook, and he breaks his glasses, and there is no 13th floor, whatever the punchline yeah. was. That was a big deal. So we watched that. And the other show that I really loved was the Dick Van Dyke show. Yes. That does hold up. The chemistry and the players, you know. And my tendency to like that kind of comedy, because I was also a big fan of the Doris Day movies. And so they had a similar feel to them. It's because Carl Reiner wrote a couple. Yes. Um, I, I would watch Father Knows Best and the and the one with Shelley Fabre. Your family affair. Or yeah, something. whatever. They were just wasting time between something you really wanted to see. Uh, and, oh, the king of the half hour for kids. Leave it to Beaver. Yes. You know. I mean, I don't know about you, but Life would have been different if um, those were my parents. Oh, absolutely. They were so That show got so <clears throat> sort of vilified when I was growing up as like, you know, life's not like Leave it to Beaver. And we started getting that Reagan nostalgia for the 50s that never existed and all yeah. that kind of stuff. But uh, only fairly recently, in the last decade or two, I've gone back and rewatched that show. And I really feel like it holds up. And especially the kids, the relationship with the kids and the way yeah. the kids are written is unlike anything else at that time where there's like a, they talk differently. There's like a neuroses and it's, it's really funny yeah. when it comes to the kids. Oh, and, and Eddie has. Yes. Hello, Mrs. Cleaver. <laughs> yeah. oh, and, and that show occupied the same universe as uh, Mayberry RFD. Yes. And Andy Griffith's show. 
because there was a place of understanding and peace, you know, and when Opie with his with his slingshot kills that bird, wow. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that was you know, it's like Oppenheimer. Yeah. <laughs> the world will never be the same. Well, it's before this bird and after the bird. Yeah. And I also used to like the Patty Duke one. Oh, I love the, the Patty Duke you one. You know, I, I yeah, the twins and um, the Beverly Hillbillies, you know. Um, but later on, I became, because I was working with Ron at. Uh, New yeah, that was going to be my question. Yeah, second unit. Yeah, I started watching Happy Days and really enjoyed that and Laverne and Shirley. I wasn't like there are periods in my life where I didn't watch much TV. College, I never saw Star Trek. I never saw anything. I watched movies only. Um, and then it happened. Um, I was doing the pilot for Parenthood, the first eighty nine, and we had a and certain people were late and I was with Brandon Tartikoff and he took us into his office you gotta see this, you gotta see this I mean, I'm the only one who likes this series and he put on an episode of Seinfeld <laughs> that had not aired yet the show had not aired and I thought it was great and my opinion of Brandon just kept soaring and I think it was the one where they're waiting to go into the Chinese to get seated in the Chinese restaurant yep. and, their whole, and I thought this is brilliant. And I, I became, of course, totally addicted to Seinfeld. And so what I've done in my notes and everything, I kind of cut everything off around 2000. Yeah. You know, and these shows I'm talking about are before that, but they're not necessarily rooted in 85. But they have a, a tether to it for sure. Like there's a 85 is yeah. almost like a, you know, it's, it's like a Rosetta Stone year in a lot of ways because stuff you had the old Hollywood stuff still kind of hanging around, and the new stuff was happening, and then you had these giant shows in the middle. Yeah, and I was doing shows that had been influenced by the shows that I had seen when I was younger. And one of the shows that I loved, and I believe it was on Saturday nights, and I have a box set of it, was a show called The Defenders. Yes with E.G. Marshall, and it's really well written, and it was all legal shows, and I've seen and directed so much legal stuff. Um, and it was all kind of contemporary social issues. And I had, growing up with Jewish liberal parents, a lot of righteous anger, and I believed in that show. And when... We went to New York to shoot Fame. So I watched Defenders in the 60s. So now it's the 80s, and we're with a New York crew, and uh, we're talking about stuff. And I, so what shows did you work on? You know, because I used to watch, you know, you shot all the shows. And, yeah, yeah, I was on camera crew. And he said, I used to work on, uh, I, you probably never heard of it, Alan. It was called The Defenders. <laughs> You were the defenders? <laughs> yeah. I, I said I was the operator on the defenders. And I said, oh, I used to watch it. And then I said to him, there's this one show. It was on for only a couple of years, but I thought it was the greatest show. It was called East Side, West Side with George C. Scott and Cicely Tyson. And he said, oh, yeah, I was the operator on that too, you know, <laughs> just before I started moving up. And he goes, but Alan, it wasn't on for a couple of years. It was on for 12 episodes, 14 episodes. And that show really tore me apart. As a, I was in high school, the issues, the social issues, at the same time that I was listening to Dylan, that show and the Dylan album times they are changing are kind of in my mind in the same place. Um, and there was an episode where a baby is bitten by a rat. Yes. And it was fantastic. And it was just the kind of thing that got it canceled. And there was an episode about real estate people who were driving blacks out of the neighborhood that could have been called the Trump story. Yes. Because that's exactly what his father mm -hmm. and him got busted for. Mm -hmm. And George C. Scott was great in it. So I love that show. Um, and, oh, 
Route 66. Yes. <laughs> and uh, that theme, it wasn't until later I realized that they were doing Kerouac. You know, uh, at the time I didn't know. But uh, I just thought that was great. And watching those again, and I have a box set, they're awfully good. And the directing is really good. There's one I've seen a couple of times with Sam Peckinpah that's directed it. And Robert Altman directed these. You know, the, the thing is where all these New York directors who did a really good job. But Route 66 and the idea that you would go from town to town and do an episode in each town along the way and then shoot some of your interiors when you got back to the studio. And there was a consistency to the locations that they chose all across America. And they showed a lot of factories and a lot of industrial backgrounds. And I, I only picked this up later. You know. So I love that. In the earlier days, things like Mr. Lucky and all that were fun, you know. And um, But then in the 80s, as a viewer, it got real serious with Hill Street News. Yeah. Hill Street Blues really struck a chord with me. And it was a show that I never missed. And when I saw that one that David Milch wrote that won the Emmy, yes. I thought this was this was so superior, you know. And the uh, the thing at the beginning where he talking he's assigning all the cases and be safe out there. And these are characters that you could live with. This is the show where the character, chemistry of the actors and the casting was so, so good, you know? And then comes a show I liked even more, which was St. Elsewhere. And St. Elsewhere's dark humor, which I found that later was all kind of based on Hospital, the movie, um, just made me love it, you know? And that's why I wanted to work on it. And Bruce Paltrow was a great person to work for. Bruce, you didn't mess with Bruce. Bruce was really tough. And you started rolling at 7.30 and you cut at 7.15. And if you didn't make, weren't going to make it, they handed you a phone and said, you tell Bruce. <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> Wait till your father gets home. Come. Tom Fontana was on it, you know, Channing uh, Gibb. I mean, all these people who went on to be showrunners. And um, John Macius, it was an impressive bunch of people. Totally male. Yes, you know? that would make sense. Totally male. Yeah, totally wise ass and so forth. Uh, but the actors and the ability, I mean, sometimes I'd be watching a scene and I'd think, oh, they went up. Then, you know, they're not doing it. That's not the dialogue. It's, well, what it was is they had gotten to this very pure place with their performances so that it seemed like they were not, there was no artifice anymore. And so it's Denzel, you know, and it's uh, uh, Alfre Woodard and it's all, all of them. And um, um, Ed Begley yes. and, and Howie Mandel and just the call sheet was fabulous. And you worked with Ed Begley on Parenthood, right? He was in Parenthood. He was in the Steve Martin. Yeah. Role, right? Yeah. And, and in Get Crazy, he plays the Oh, villain. that's right. He does. I love being around Ed. He's the funniest guy. I liked Law and Order, and I got to direct one, but it was not a fun show to direct because its pattern that was instituted by Greg Hoblet who also had created NYPD Blue, in this case was too strict. It had one size, almost exactly the size I am now, you know, and it was, the idea was it was director proof, which was fine because the scripts were so great, but it wasn't something, and I was doing moonlighting at the time, you know, and so moonlighting was like so much different and so great, so much what I liked. That's why I succeeded at Moonlighting because those were the movies that I liked, you know, the screwball comedies, the romantic comedies. Yeah. And so one of the reasons that I succeeded so well at that period of my career was some people can imitate voices and have an ear for it, you know, and do accents. I can do a visual thing. I can look at something, know how they did it, and do it the same, you know. 
Um, then I'll fly away, which is another show that I did that I loved before I did. Yeah, that was. I'll great fly show. away was fantastic, and the episode I did, the first one I did, was about an abortion. And it was such a great episode, and the actors were so good. And I was also, and that was David Chase. That's the first time I worked with David Chase, and um, who I also loved Northern Exposure. I love Northern Exposure. <laughs> yeah, so I used to love that. And when we were doing Crossing Jordan, Northern Exposure was what we were trying to do. We're saying elsewhere, we were not trying to do Law and Order, much to the. <laughs> anger of the net yes they hate the personal stories you know and they would say why can't you be more like because we were getting beaten by them um homicide or csi csi yeah. Miami. yeah yeah why can't you be like csi miami what is wrong with you and they have these fights and they i'd say you guys don't understand the show CSI Miami is a show about tweezers. <laughs> yes. They come to the crime scene and it's just, it's photographed like no crime scene. Right. You know, it's beautiful shot. Nobody moves, but there's tweezers. Yes. And there's lots of tweezers. When our people come to the crime scene, they argue who forgot the tweezers. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's it. Well, that's we're done with that. And now you got to do proceed. By then, we were in our second season. The damage had been right. done. There, you know, the characters were they were set. And a show that David Chase did that nobody has really seen, which was called Almost Grown. Oh yeah, and it was about boomers, and it had fantastic song. Was it Tim Daly? Was he in that show? Yes, Tim Daly was in it, and I loved that. And David was always tickled when I talked to him about that. Um, NYPD Blues, um, and, um, uh, 30 something. Yeah. I really, what I liked about 30 something was that it seemed like it was almost anti-dramatic. That the style of the acting, and I ended up talking to Marshall Herskovitz about this quite a bit, was to make it seem like the camera just happened to be there when this part of life was going on. There was no theatricality to it, you know. There was no big shot, you know. And uh, Winnie Holtzman wrote brilliant scripts, everyone who wrote for that show. And it felt like you were tossed into each other's life. Now, also, that show annoyed the shit out of a lot of critics, you know, because it was so white and so middle class, upper middle class and and yuppie values and i remember the village voice when peter horton died they put a uh in the tv review it said one down six to go Ooh. Um, Ooh, <laughs> oh god luck. but um i also love wonder years you know i just really appreciate that and and i like danny's narration in it because i'd work with him already i'm getting crazy and from the first episode on, ER had me. The style of it, the intensity of it, the lack of like big moments, but that were big moments, you know, and the way that camera moved. And I was teaching a class in producing and directing for television called um, Creativity on Demand. And I had we would talk about TV series and there was a bunch of exercise. So I, I'm going to bring my friend, Jonathan Kaplan, who directed ER and was an executive producer on it. And we'll look at an ER episode. And I had never seen an episode of ER in a theater on a big screen. It was like the born identity. Yeah. The way that camera moved so fast and around things. They, they went crazy. They poor Jonathan was like, oh, my God, did I direct us? And yes. Look at the size of it. You know, it was so visceral. But that show, too, I, I talked to Bonnie Hunt about this. With She made a movie called Return to Me that I really loved. Um, and there's a, mm -hmm. there's a death scene in it that stands out because you don't see the person die. You just see the person 
be told and then what happens after. And ER did that, where even though you have these fast-paced, basically born identity action scenes where they're, you know, in the ER room, all yeah. of the biggest emotional impact scenes were very small and very quiet and someone just telling someone information and then breaking down. It wasn't like you would see in the past yeah. where they're like, why? Or, you know, they see, they can save. The, it's, it was yeah. none of that. And it, it, that just blew my mind. I learned a lot from ER that I applied to Crossing Jordan. Because in Crossing Jordan, people were being told why someone had died or whatever the situation was. And it was often Jill Hennessy. And sometimes a scene would be on the pages so dramatic that I didn't want to do it too many times. So I would talk to the DP and give him a heads up that I wanted to do crossing angles, that both people would be lit. So he would design the lighting to do that beforehand. He'd be thinking about it. And we'd talk about where we could set the scene. And one of the places was on Jordan's couch because there was a window behind it and you could cross backlight on them. And there was a little coffee table and we cover it with white cloth and bounce light into it. So you have something that's really alive and you're basically doing the close-ups first. And they can overlap and everything. And then we drop back and do a, a slow moving two shot. You know, so a lot of that was, you know, stuff that I was very lucky to be able to be creative in these areas and reference stuff that I had seen and learned from because I knew the techniques. I mean, I could, the list of movies that I have recreated scenes yeah. from would make you laugh. <laughs> I've done whole scenes from, uh, oh, on Moonlighting, we did a scene from Sullivan's Travels and nobody knows. <laughs> right. On Heroes, we did the opening of Eight and a Half, nobody knows that. But, you know, <laughs> all of these things that I love that I just said, well, this is just like that. So let's just stage it. And, of course, the show that I truly also adored was The West Wing. Yeah. You know, the West Wing. So um, that's kind of an overview of the drama and the half hours. And then there's the outliers, SCTV. My all-time favorite. SCTV. <laughs> yeah, please. SCTV was nuts. Yeah. You know, it's one of those cases where there was no adult in the room and we're at a better people for it. Oh, so good. I had Dave Thomas on and we, we talked in detail. <laughs> And doing Annie yes. Hall. Yeah. Or he does uh he does taxi driver with um with uh Woody Allen and then he does one with George Carlin. Yes. Oh well, first off, Andrea Martin's the funniest person in the world. And John Candy, I'm the guy with the snake on his face. And Catherine O'Hara. Commitment to a character is complete. There is no opinion there. She is this character, and the more ridiculous the character, the more committed. And that character she had called Lola Heatherton, <laughs> where she would sit on the couch and had that short little low, uh, Joey Heatherton hairdo and this big overstated... Um, <laughs> I want to bear your children. I'm going to bear your children. Uh, she was all those people rolled up into one on the Sammy Maudlin show. You know? So SCTV, as you can now tell, is a summation of my obsession with television and breaking the third wall and being ins insular. And um, on Saturday nights in the 70s, no matter where I was, I would figure out how long it would take to get me home by 1130. And I remember being out in Tarzana and making it home in 25 minutes <laughs> because I had to see the two swinging guys, you know, on Saturday Night Live. And Hilda Radner, when she did the little girl in the bedroom, is, I showed that to my daughters. It's just brilliant. And Todd and her the nerds. And, the, and the guy at the bar at the crack yep. and just, you know, that show was appointment TV in the biggest possible way. And one of the best times I ever saw it, we were doing Grand Theft Auto. 
with Ron. So that was about 77. And we shot on location for a week in Victorville, California. And that's like about 90 miles from L.A. So we didn't go home overnight. We shot on Saturday and then at Sunday off. And so after a week of shooting with Ron and everyone, everyone's in the bar drinking flamers. And what a flamer was is that we learned this from the Joey Chitwood Thrill Show, our stuntman, <laughs> is you take a shot of tequila, you set it on fire, and you, and you <laughs> knock it back. So there was a lot of that going on. But at like 11.20, I said, Saturday Night Live's coming on Saturday Night And we all piled into my hotel room and watched Saturday Night Live together, (laughs) just roaring. And it was an episode with, of all people, Broderick Crawford was the guest. Oh, yes. And they were doing this scene where he was doing Highway Patrol. He he did that series. And he pulls over this guy and he says... Where are you going at that speed? What's your name? And he says, Jack Kerouac. And he says, well, where are you headed, Mr. Kerouac? And he quotes on the road, yeah. you know, and speeding across America. The front. And I thought, I'm in here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so Heroes was a great first season. Um, if I can do a little summation yeah. of... Uh, uh, there are so many St. Elsewhere's that I love doing. There are parts of the fame episodes because they were very simplistic. They were life lessons. And the big mistake that show made was they wanted each one to be contained and it should have been serialized, yeah. but they wouldn't have that. You know, I've gone back and looked at my moonlighting ones because it's out now Finally. on yeah. uh, Hulu. Yes, and I just did a, a thing on there, the Moonlighting on Facebook pages, and I did a whole interview where I asked questions. And watching them again, after all this time, I felt like such an idiot. I'm sitting at home watching them alone. I'm laughing my ass off. They were really fun. And what I noticed was that they were not just funny. They were poignant. And that not to the director, let's, let's separate the director, even though I was the director. Ability to change the pace and go from that bing, 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 bing stuff to those moments where they would sit and think. And the camera would watch them and move on them. And Jerry Finneman, the DP, would put them in a half light. And it would you were like doing The Apartment, you know, or a film noir. Made me think, wow. That was some three years of my life. That, and I was very, very lucky to be on the zeitgeist of relationships between men and women. And that show was 80s that way. She was the Mm -hmm. boss and he was the toxic male. But he was funny and he was smart and had respect for each other. And then I hit that zeitgeist again 10 years later with Allie McBeal. And my agent said, you're perfect for this. You got to do this. So, you know, I think I watched the pilot and I thought, yeah, this is great. And I got this script. And the main A story was Allie is going to sleep with a guy who has a giant dick. <laughs> um, that was the A story. <laughs> that was the first time she- on the show, and of course, because it's David Kelly, right. there's this running gag of that. Plus, there was a storyline about male masculinity, and the case that Ali had was a guy had protected his girlfriend and gotten a fight, and so that was the thing about it. And the C story was about this boxing match that all the men were really excited about, and they wanted everyone in the office to go watch it on TV. But the D story. This is like the fourth biggest story was Allie was seeing a dancing baby. And, you know, ABC, gone. Yep. <laughs> D is where that show lives forever. Huge. Huge. I mean, the next day. Uh, so all we had for you people, uh, all we had was that little screensaver of the baby. That's what David had seen. And somewhere in his head, he thought that should appear and Allie would see it. And he wrote in it to some scenes. 
But we didn't have, they didn't have anything more than that. So we bought a couple of dolls of different sizes and we put them on the set and took stills of them so we could figure out what size the baby should be. And then I, we, atta- we made a decision and I attached a broom handle, a prop stick, to the back of the baby that we wanted and walked them through setups so we could see and took pictures. And then David Kelly came down and the people, and we did this sort of roughly the scenes and we cut out one or two because we thought there was too many but we got a sense of what it was going to be like because we didn't have all that existed was 17 seconds <laughs> yeah. of it you know doing that dance to that song and that's what we shot you know and then after it was cut together david called me up and says you know we should never have taken a come on over <laughs> And we're going to shoot one scene. We're going to add a Need scene. more baby. Because that baby's really good, Yeah. You know? And the finale of that show where they're dan- she's dancing with the baby. And Callista was such a great actress to work with. She is a thoroughbred. She's not built for TV. You got to be a little bit more of a, of a Clydesdale. <laughs> right. <laughs> Beast of burden. <laughs> she was mad. And when I saw it all cut together, and I remember seeing it in the afternoon before it was the Christmas party and going to David, and it's like, we thought it was good. And I thought, all right, this is really good. And I told my agent. So my agent comes over to my house to watch it. And I think it went on at 9. So around 6.30 or 7 o'clock, my phone rings. And hello? Is this Alan? Yeah. And I says, I'm not sure you remember me. My name is Miss Kissel. I was your teacher senior year of high school. I said, of course I remember you. You were the only one that encouraged me. She says, I just saw that Ally McBeal you did. And I am so proud of you. You are always had an original mind. And then she tells me about the short story I wrote that she remembered. It was so great. And then my agent is watching it and she goes, I'm going to have to have a lot of copies. <laughs> and, you know, they re-ran it two weeks later. And so that and then the following year, The Temptations. The Temptations is probably the best thing I've ever done. I say that because the feedback I get from so many people of the nature of it being a family show, which at the making of it, that was not what I had in mind, but the family things were so strong, really, really comes through. And that and Rock and Roll High School is what most people approach me about. And the generational thing with Temptations and with Rock and Roll High School Everyone loves the Ramones, but it is the agency of Riff Randall that comes through. Riff Randall, the movie without Riff Randall and PJ's performance and the fact that she will not be stopped and she's a young woman and it's about it and it's not exploitative makes that movie. Um, A lot of the episodes of Crossing Jordan, I was so devoted to that show. And... um, Heroes, the first season, and a couple other things after that. And then I did a series one, Fortunate Events. Yes. The Lemony Snicket one. And it was in the second season. And I did an episode called uh, Haunted Hospital, I think. And there was two episodes. And that is probably the next to the last thing I ever directed. Um, I got an Emmy nomination, a DGA nomination for it. And I worked really hard to get that job. And here's what I said to the executive producer. Um, and when he said, okay, so you've seen the, um, oh, Barry Sonnenfeld. You seem to really understand the visuals and so forth and the visual style. I really like that you understand what I was trying to do and the eye lines and everything. So, so he says, what are you going to bring to it? <laughs> and I said, I see this as a cross between Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein, the duck, the Marx Brothers in Duck Soup, and Stanley Kubrick's The Shining. <laughs> Sold. And he looks at me and says, I have 
don't know what the fuck you're <laughs> talking about. And he turns to Rose, the executive producer, and he goes, Rose? And Rose says, if he says he's going to do that, he's going to do that. I know, Al. <laughs> and, and it was the last thing I did, but I never got any work off of it. And then I got offered the job at AFI, and I've never been happier. Because I'm passing on the knowledge that I got from Corman, that I got from Scorsese in film school, that I got from Bruce Paltrow. And also, Debbie Allen was a very important person in my life. And here we are. It's an amazing full circle thing. Like it's with your brain and, and love and knowledge of all the stuff that you watched and enjoyed, which clearly comes across on screen. And yeah, going from being taught by Scorsese when you're in film school to now you're teaching it. It's like, it's almost too perfect of a bookend. I know. It's really great. And um, I really enjoy uh, film school, you know, and stuff. And I've, I play a little clip every week, a film clip every week at the end of class to illustrate something, you know. And um, or what did we watch last week? We watched One Car Wise, Fallen Angels, and the scene in The Shining where uh, they're walking around seeing the, the kitchen and how everything works. And we were discussing the use of wide-angle lens. We're going to see a couple music numbers from the Tammy Show. I love the Tammy Show. You know the Tammy Show? I want you to name three artists that you would show to the class from the Tammy Show. There are no wrong answers. Oh, um, James Brown? James Brown is the one that I always run. But I decided I'm also going to add Chuck Berry from the beginning because it's so exciting and because... People don't credit his lyric writing enough. No, the storytelling he did in lyrics is... Uh, storytelling yeah. and the spirit of mid-century America and also Leslie Gore. Because of the degree of what's on the mind of young filmmakers, and one of them is gender, and the fact that she was in the closet then and then came out, I thought would be really interesting, you know, to show to the class. And she's the only person who gets the male gaze lensing, you know, with the Vaseline around it. And she sings, you don't own me. So I think there's a ton of irony in there. Right now I'm watching uh, the one uh, lessons in chemistry. I think that's really good. Um, and uh, murder at the edge of the world, which I'm enjoying. Um, I like uh, The Gilded Age, even though it's way over the top soapy. Big time. Yeah. Um, the morning show just fell apart on watching it, you know. And there was a show a couple of years ago where it was almost like an anthology. Uh, and it was called American Something, and it were mostly socialist. Not American Horror that Story? Never... Okay. Now, here's my opinion on American Horror Story. I'm right? not a fan. <laughs> That's my <laughs> yep, yep. Same page here as comes me. Loud. Yeah, and you know, here's weirdness. Um, it's okay, it, you know. I've always wanted to work for him, and God, I wanted to work for Lee, and I took three meetings and didn't get the job. It's all coming out here, folks. <laughs> we get all the dirt, everybody. <laughs> and I really, really, really like Lee, and really wanted to get that job for whatever reason. I didn't. So that's okay. So those are, oh, and I'm really liking the new Fargo. And a couple of years ago, there was a great show about two police detectives in charge of rape squads. And this woman had been raped, and they realized that both their cases were converging. And Lisa Kotelenko was the executive producer and writer, and it was all women on the staff. And uh, it was on, I believe, Netflix. And it was one of the best television series I've ever seen. Mm. Uh, I can't remember the title because the title doesn't really resonate. Right, right. But it was great. I, I'm a huge fan of Lisa Kotelenko's work. And the one she did with Frances McDormand after that. And, you know, I know her a little bit, but she's a terrific director. Just great. Yeah. It's a lot of good stuff out still. Yeah, we're seeing a change. And I talked to my students about this because as much as the auteur theory was the centerpiece of my college years, 
what the centerpiece now is, whether people know it or not, is male gaze and female gaze yeah. and the difference between them and, of course, the history of the male gaze. And we are seeing a change in how people are played, how their stories are written, and how they're photographed as more and more women direct Listen, there are more women in my AFI class of 150 than there are men. And three quarters of the cinematographers are women. So we're seeing a difference. And what we're not seeing anymore is I'm not seeing, and I'm ahead of the curve here because they're, they're, they're coming up. And, but I do see it in the shows, is the long lens close up with the key light coming in and the softening. What you're seeing now is more wide-angle lens coverage and women being presented in a more real, in the sense of way that they appear, you know, and also in the stories. So we're going through, as the um, sage of television, <laughs> yes. we're a long way from father knows best. <laughs> I and that's a good thing. When I told the class that the son was called Bud and the youngest daughter was called Kitten yes. and the oldest daughter was called Princess, they groaned. <laughs> People injured their eyes rolling them, I imagine, at that oh point. Oh, my God. <laughs> well, that was best. Well, thank you so much. As I said, I've, I've wanted to talk to you for a really long time. This has been so great. I really appreciate you taking the time. You're welcome. It was fun prepping for it. What a good dude, right? Uh, amazing career. Just such a nice, humble, down-to-earth guy who's done so many amazing things. Uh, again, cannot thank him enough for sitting down and talking to, to little old me. Uh, if you have guests you would like me to try to get on the show, please email me at Kenneth, uh, Kenneth I, can read .com. I, I know I said Kenneth. Uh, it's not Kenneth. It's Kenneth I can read .com or tvguidancecounselor gmail.com. Also over on the Patreon Patreon, patron, Patreon, over on the Patreon. Uh, you can give as little as a dollar a month. You can talk to other fans of the show there. You can send me messages there. And if you were a $5 or more patron, you would have received a PDF of the two issues I scanned for Alan. There's a 1985 issue with Moonlighting on the cover and a 1989 issue with Moonlighting on the cover. We only discuss uh, the stuff in the 1985 issue in this episode for, well, you just heard it, so you know why. Um, but I put the two PDFs up of that of those that you could look at this week if you so wanted to uh that is the show we're here each and every week so hopefully you'll be back next time because i'll have a brand new episode of tv guidance counselor is gonna sleep with a guy who has a giant dick